morning to everyone. My name is Ken Kern. I serve as the uh, Deputy Bureau Chief in our Cybercrime and Identity Theft Bureau. And it's a pleasure to have all of you here today. Part of our conference goal this morning is to answer the question, what is the state of affairs in intellectual property in today's digital landscape? On the bright side, intellectual <coughs> property is an incredible asset that serves as the engine of economic growth and constitutes a larger and larger share of the world's GDP. Frankly, it is the creative capital that fuels the modern day economy. On the not so bright side, those seeking to illegally secure intellectual property are numerous, spread throughout the world, and attack every type of industry. Like many cyber criminals, they use cutting edge technology to expand their market reach and steal customers from legitimate brand holders like yourself. <coughs> Suffice it to say, individuals trying to protect intellectual property rights, like many of you in the room today, have their hands full. Today's panel, our first panel, uh, Technology and Intellectual Property Enforcement, <coughs> is designed to try to address not only what the landscape looks like, but what some of the solutions are in the field right now. I will uh, briefly introduce four of our uh, three of our distinguished panelists. Uh, their full biographies are located in your conference agenda in your folders. Uh, on my right is Jason Drangle. Uh, Jason is a partner at Epstein Drangle LLP. He is an influential voice in the trademark and copyright fields of law. He's actively engaged in anti-counterfeit work involving film, television, digital applications, and much, much more. Jason will share with you some of the programs that he has created to thwart counterfeit uh, <coughs> products in the marketplace. To my left. Ruby Mages is the Director of Strategic Planning within Pfizer Global Security. Ruby has served with distinction in both the public and private sectors. At the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, she handled complex investigations and trials as a member of our Rackets Bureau. Ruby serves on several industry working groups and has published numerous articles on the subject of counterfeit pharmaceuticals an increasing problem in today's economy, especially in the digital landscape. Brian Lansing, to my right, serves as Assistant General Counsel of Brand Integrity at Altria Client Services, a subsidiary of the Altria Group. He manages specialized intellectual property litigation in the areas of anti-counterfeiting and trademark infringement including combating a legal online sale of tobacco products. He also works extensively with state and federal prosecutors in anti-counterfeiting and tobacco smuggling cases. In addition, I would like to point out uh, he is a captain in the United States Navy Reserve and presides as a general court martial military trial judge in Norfolk, Virginia. Finally, Michael Hill to my left, is an enforcement specialist at Rosetta Stone. Michael's academic background is in computer science and information systems technology. In addition to his work in protecting Rosetta Stone's software and intellectual property, Michael, Michael is a frequent lecturer throughout the country where he teaches federal and state law enforcement as well as private sector uh, about detecting intellectual property theft. We are so fortunate to have all four panelists here today. Uh, and I will start with Jason Drangle's presentation. At the end of all four of the uh, panelists, we'll then take questions from the audience. So without further ado, I'll turn the, the microphone over to Jason Drangle. working with the Angry Bird people and 
they uh, it sort of came out of that relationship. They're actually inventors from Finland, and so we had a major time difference, and we had a serious anti counterfeiting problem in the United States. They had about 250 different licensees uh, throughout the world, and they were seeing an explosion of anti counterfeiting. So we just sat down with their executives to try and figure out how can we sort of coordinate all this information uh, that we're getting from consumers, law enforcement, uh, and work on that information and coordinate it all in real time. So what we did was we came up with this uh, system that we call You Faker, and we released that in uh, July of this year. And what is You Faker? You Faker is a, uh, a system to collaborate on anti-counterfeiting activities uh, amongst law firms, investigators, law enforcement, uh, and licensees, uh, everybody involved with the, the grant process in one place. So everyone can sign on to the system, trademark owners, law firms, investigators, law enforcement, they get accounts, and then they can coordinate on specific actions uh, uh, that they're working on together. And again, there are different permission levels that the system has, so uh, law enforcement can get be given access to submit reports, gain access to information, uh, and you know, just that types of information that are relevant to them. Basically what you do is you enter your, your brands into the system, and then you indicate what brands you have, the full product lines, you enter customs uh, counterfeit guides as to how to identify counterfeits in the marketplace, information that you're uh, comfortable with sharing with uh, investigators, law enforcement, and or the public. You then start entering the reports that you receive into the system, whether it comes from your investigators, whether it comes from custom shipment seizures, uh, or just information that you're starting to receive from consumers. And again, with Angry Birds, given the explosion of their product and social media and uh, using cell phones, we were getting uh, inundated with email information about counterfeits that consumers were seeing in the marketplace. So we wanted a way uh, to have a way for those consumers to report this information uh, without being inundated with emails. So that's part of what we incorporate into the system. So you know the brand owners can go into the system, enter their own uh, reports whether they be investigations, seizures, uh, civil actions, uh, law enforcement trainings, and then track the status of the reporting uh, of the investigation while you're going through it. Each report then can be assigned to specific law firms who are working on it, investigators, uh, law enforcement. So as, as they become part of the system, you can assign them to that specific report so they can see updated status of what's going on in that action. Each report has the uh, information from the targets that you're going after, the manufacturer, the retailers, the wholesalers. During the course of your investigation, you're going to start compiling all that information on the flow uh, of, the, of the counterfeit goods. So, so you start building a database of infringers that you're targeting. You enter all the information about the uh, locations, the individuals who are working at the locations, <coughs> start adding all this information into your specific counterfeit database. And basically, on an ongoing basis, you're going to start building this database and sharing it, coordinating it amongst all the reports. Basically, each report then has a work log flow where uh, the reports from investigators and or uh, CMD notices <laughs> give to your, uh, to your investigators, pleadings, what have you, all get entered into the same report. So, Everybody can check in from anywhere they are in the world and see what the status of that report uh, and that action is uh, at, at that point. And you can see all this information on a specific dashboard that shows all the brands that you're working on, see all the reports, the reminders, uh, what have you. Uh, it's completely searchable. A lot of times, over time, you're going to start within this database uh, forgetting the individuals that you've identified so you can start searching uh, them out cross-referencing them within the reports. When you search them, it'll pull up, it'll show you the individual reports that they're involved in, and then it allows you to see all the connections that they have in the matter. This is a factory uh, managing there to you factory. They've been uh, uh, connected to five specific reports of counterfeiting, and if you wanted to see the connection
connections that they've had to other parties throughout all these reports. So you click on the connection button, and it pulls up a map, and it shows you that factory has sold to cut lung, uh, wholesaler, they've been involved with other manufacturers and retailers. It shows you the whole connection. For years, uh, anti-counterfeiting investigations have basically worked off of Excel spreadsheets and uh, you know, folders and running through that information and trying to see the flow of the goods. It's been very difficult uh, to coordinate. Now, you can basically click a button and see who's involved with what, when, when it's happening. What's really nice about the system is that we have connected it with Kanjiva, which is a compiler of customs information. So we, we cross-reference our specific database of counterfeiters against their database of custom shipments. And for every party in the database, it shows you the number of shipments that have come into the United States over the last 12 months. You also get email notices every time a new shipment comes into the United States. You'll be notified, OK, maybe we need to investigate this new shipment to see if they're a counterfeit. It's just a, 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 another way to sort of keep tabs on the counterfeiters that you know about. What we're doing with the system is we're trying, us and brand owners are trying to uh, engage, use social media to enlist consumers, investigators, law enforcement, everybody to report counterfeits that they see in the marketplace. We want you, Faker, to be the be and all and end all for reporting counterfeits. So we are using social media as a means to engage them. Uh, we are using it to <coughs> educate consumers how to identify counterfeits that they see in the marketplace, uh, tell them about the risks, tell them about the lost wages, you know, all the bad things that we know about counterfeiting, and, uh, and permit them to you know, report counterfeits, get involved, and earn rewards while doing so. Something like this, we have we represent pillow pets. They would tweet out some information or post something on their Facebook saying, you know, they're involved with the system. We'd like you to report counterfeits to the extent to see those types of things. Because they're the people on the streets, the investigators, law enforcement, consumers, they're the ones walking through flea markets, uh, you know, on boardwalks and different places like that. And they're the ones who are seeing it. So with social media, uh, we just believe that it's easiest, quickest way to get the information to the proper brand owner. Within the UFAKER system, there are counterfeit guides. So each brand owner can make available uh, to consumers public information that they're uh, happy to share with consumers on how to identify counterfeit goods. Brand owners have the ability to, to keep this information confidential and just share the information with their investigators and or law enforcement because those are certain tells that they don't want to share with the public. Consumers can sign on, uh, law enforcement can sign on, they can have accounts with the system. Uh, they can sign on through Facebook, uh, or they can report anonymously. And basically what we do is, now there's an app for anti-counterfeiting. We created an app that's on the iPhone and uh, Android system, and it's a simple app for consumers, for investigators, for law enforcement to now identify products while they're out, uh, and send it to you faker. So you basically identify the trademark, the product, where you located it. You would take a few uh, photographs of what they've located. You would attach that, and then that report would get sent to the brand owner. A lot of times, the investigators, law enforcement are out in the marketplace, and they don't have uh, the information about who to send the infringement that they see to. So uh, what happens is the system automatically sends it to part of the system, but not part of the system, uh, we are trying to handle on an ongoing basis as many brand owners as possible so they can take quick action to, to counter the problem. These are examples of some of the photos uh, of what we've seen, uh, some of the reports we've gotten. Since July, we've had about 700 downloads of the app, and this is just consumer-based. Uh, consumers are reporting it. We've had 60 plus reports since mid July, and we're seeing that consumers do have an interest. There's all different products that we've seen. It's, they've identified websites, they've identified products they've seen in the marketplace, and we see an increased interest on their part. Uh, what we do is we reward the hunters.
challengers for uh, 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 giving information on the counterfeits, and then we hope landowners will do so on top of that. Second panelist of today, uh, Ruby Mangi. Good morning. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Vance and Ken for the opportunity uh, to be here to talk about a subject that is near and dear to my heart, that is the anti counterfeiting as it impacts <coughs> uh, patients. Um, pharmaceutical counterfeiting is a crime of tripping. life-saving medicine um, for less money than with the local pharmacy by going online. And they're deceived because what they get um, will not provide them the therapeutic benefit. And in the worst situation, it may even kill them. It's because of this threat, and although there are obviously various IP rights involved, you have the patent for the active ingredient, you have the trademark for the company name, the product name, trade dress, perhaps the, uh, the packaging, the copyright, but we view it as an issue of patient health and safety. And it's because of that that we have a very focused and aggressive anti-counterfeiting program uh, to detect and disrupt the major manufacturers and distributors of counterfeit medicines. And they say that a picture is worth a thousand words, so I would just like to show you why we say that counterfeit medicine are a threat to patient safety. First, it's because of the conditions under which they are manufactured in China, China, <coughs> India, that, that's the mix we're looking for, um, and in Pakistan, where they're making Corex, a uh, cough syrup. Now, counterfeiters um, are much more concerned with the appearance of their product rather than what's in it. This tablet, which was produced <coughs> in uh, Colombia, is Constan. It's an anti-inflammatory, and rather than the active ingredient contain boric acid, which kills roaches, rip dust to hold it together, um, yellow highway paint to give it its color, and Florax to give it its sheen. Now, Constan is an excellent example that this is not just somebody trying to steal your IP. Constan has been off patent now for probably close to 50 years. So that any company that wanted to could go to the regulatory authorities and get permission to uh, produce a generic. But in order to do that, they need to meet manufacturing guidelines, they need to prove a biological equivalency or effectiveness, and need to actually have the active ingredient in the medicine. Uh, this is another example, um, and despite the conditions under which the manufacturing tablets are manufactured, they can still be very convincing copies. Uh, this case is, is um, of significance for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, the uh, Viagra and other medicines, there were 41 lines of medicines um, from various manufacturers seized when the authorities uh, did this raid. But these um, tablets were being distributed in the U.S. over the internet. And it was a network of more than 108, I believe it was, um, brokers primarily in the U.S. and in Europe. The gentleman, and I used to come this week, uh, behind this operation, David Lang, um, is, is also sort of special to me. Um, when he, he was using the name of Wen Wei Li, I actually prosecuted him when I was in the district attorney's office. And to Mr. Vance's point about how we um, do sometimes stretch the borders when we uh, bring our cases and, and seek jurisdiction, um, Pfizer had uh, been pursuing uh, this gentleman who was advertising counterfeit by action um, over the internet. They had introduced it undercover. Um, and they couldn't get the uh, federal authorities to take the case. Um, the person who was then general counsel at um, Pfizer was friends with Mr. Mordenthal, came in, and of course Mr. Mordenthal uh, says he would be 
happy uh, to take the case. We simply substituted our undercover uh, for the Pfizer undercover. And then we invited um, Mr. Lee to come to the U.S. to meet a major distributor to build his network. Um, he came in, we treated him to a nice dinner, we videotaped um, the meeting, which turned out to be an added benefit because when two of his U.S. brokers found that he was coming to the U.S., they asked to be invited to the meeting. So we had a lovely undercover meeting. Um, the soft look on his face when the detectives emerged from the uh, bedroom uh, to place him under arrest. Um, but he was so angry with Pfizer for having arranged it that after he was released from the hospitality of New York State Prison, he went back to China, changed his name, um, and then began uh, counterfeiting Pfizer products again. Now, um, as I said, sometimes they contain no ingredient, the long active ingredient, or the incorrect <coughs> But we've also found things um, pictures speak for themselves. And my favorite is, 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 uh, is the rat voice. So, you know, you really are taking um, your health, your life into your hands if you unsuspectedly get a counterfeit medicine. Now, what adds to the threat is that the tablets are virtually um, undetectable. This is a comparison photo of counterfeit, and I won't tell you quite yet which is a counterfeit, that actually breached the legitimate U.S. supply chain. This was in the U.S. supply chain. It was being dispensed to patients from pharmacies. Um, and when the recall was completed, we were fortunate that it was not a Pfizer recall because all of the stuff had been repackaged. So that was easy to distinguish from the legitimate product from the counterfeit. There were a total of 18 million tablets recalled, and every bottle had a mix of counterfeit and authentic tablets that had been diverted from of Brazil, where the product is much less expensive. Anyone care to guess which is the other one? <coughs> On the right. Um, they make it easy for me and other people who do the presentations to keep the right on the right. But as you can tell, the, the differences are almost um, imperceptible. Even on packaging, um, it can be different. Now, we go around the world and we, we train law enforcement agencies, customs, what to look for so they can tell the difference. Um, I saw this, this comparison photo and, and the lab report that accompanied me said, oh, it's obvious this is counterfeit because of the misspacing on the packaging. And it wasn't until I actually superimposed, it was one eighth of a centimeter difference in the packaging. Uh, this is compliments of the Russians who are absolutely brilliant at, uh, in the art of counterfeit. Um, now, we're always asked how large is the problem? And, and even though the WHO has, has estimated that it is you know, around 1% in the US, they have long ago given up trying to estimate how much it is in various um, economies. And that's at least in part because the only metric that you really have is the number of seizures. And as we all know, that's just the tip of the iceberg. But we can tell you geographically how widespread it is, 106 countries. Now, you may notice that there's very little in Africa. Uh, I'm not going to try to convince you that there are no counterfeits in Africa, but the, the problem that we encounter is that the countries just don't have the infrastructure there to intercept them and to report them. And in many countries there, it's not even illegal. Um, and here in the US, we have found it in 32 states and Puerto Rico. Now, these are instances where we have confirmed it, we've gotten a sample, we have tested it, or we can tell from uh, one of the lot numbers matching it with an expiration date that it's not authentic. Perhaps <coughs> even more frightening is the fact that 24 of our medicines, counterfeit versions, have been found in the legitimate supply chains in 59 countries. In the U.S., we just had um, Viagra and Lipitor. The internet was dominated by many, many, many um, independent OLPs as depicted here. What we have seen more recently, however, is the consolidation into what we call affiliate networks. So that you have a number of eight of the OLPs, but they then funnel through common payment pages and payment processors. And I will show you um, in just a few moments how this actually uh, permits a very much more effective disruption than going one side at a time. You also have a threat um, on the internet social media, um, Facebook, a great place to um, advertise. And if the people who are advertising only for the picture without any text, it's virtually impossible to find. 
In this particular instance, <coughs> we know, I can tell from looking at it that it's counterfeit because the bands to the left of the dark blue stripes and the name Viagra are in green. Um, it should be in blue. Uh, this is a packaging that was intended for the Malaysian market, which we have seen um, in probably 75 cases. from Jason, Pharmaceuticals, through Ruby. I'll now turn over to Brian, who will talk about some of his work at Altria. Thank you, Ken, and thank you to Mr. Vance as well, uh, and as well as Jeremy for having me this morning. And uh, good morning to all of you. As a native New Yorker, it's nice to be back in New York. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what we do at Altria.
Harvest USA is one of the operating companies that, uh, that is within Alfred Group. It owns the Marlboro trademark uh, in the United States and only the United States. Uh, Philip Morris International, which used to be part of Alfred Group and uh, has been for a number of years, owns the trademark uh, throughout the rest of the world. Um, so what that does is it creates a unique uh, problem for us in the intellectual property space because not only do we have to deal with counterfeit, we have to deal with uh, legitimately made product by Philip Morris International coming into the United States uh, that, is, uh, that is trafficked here by smugglers. So in either case, it is a, uh, not only a, a hit to the company's bottom line, but it's also um, a, uh, an infringement of the trademark. So you've seen a slide like this before, uh, uh, like the kind that uh, Ruby provided. Uh, this is an actual uh, uh, footage from Suffice to say, it is a non-regulated environment. So as you imagine, for most IT holders in the, uh, in the room, China is the, uh, is the largest uh, source uh, country for counterfeit product. There are some others. Uh, and uh, it is estimated that about 400 billion of these uh, cigarettes are counterfeit per year. Um, and you can see the cost disparity between uh, how much it costs to make a counterfeit product and how much you can realize once it uh, reaches the United States. Um, and as I stated earlier, uh, unlike the uh, domestic uh, industry now, uh, which is regulated by the FDA since 2009, um, counterfeit is in a, a non-regulated environment and is subject to no controls whatsoever. So sea cargo is uh, one of the biggest ways that uh, the counterfeit comes into the country. Uh, it, uh, it's been the traditional model. Um, but over the years, it, we have seen uh, through the internet that, uh, through internet sales, that uh, while we still get containers coming into the country here and there, and uh, Customs and Border Protection uh, sees those containers where they can find them, uh, increasingly, counterfeiters and uh, smugglers are using the postal service um, uh, and mails to, uh, to peddle their products to U.S. consumers. So I'll give you a picture of this, of the online space, which, uh, which is what I did with. Um, back in about uh, the early part of, uh, of the 2000s, uh, we realized that we had a, we had a problem because we started getting consumer complaints because uh, either the product that they bought uh, tasted funny, or in some cases it made them sick immediately when they, uh, when they used it. Um, so we started taking a look at the online space, and we saw that we had a lot. We had some foreign websites that were uh, operated uh, overseas by uh, in other countries, uh, mostly in European countries uh, such as Italy. And uh, what they were tracking in was uh, either counterfeit or legally uh, imported product. And Marlboro is the number one trademark that they like to uh, that they like to peddle. Um, over time, uh, we saw a rise of domestic websites because uh, word got out in cyberspace that this was a good way to make money. So people would, uh, would either smuggle product within the United States from state to state, or they would uh, develop uh, relationships with some of these overseas uh, individuals. Uh, and had more domestically hosted sites. Then the PACT Act, which is the Prevent All Cigarette Trafficking Act, was passed uh, in, in 2011, uh, which pretty much did away with the, uh, with the domestic sites. So then what we saw was an emergence of more, uh, once again, more uh, foreign websites. Instead of having uh, just a few websites that were selling a great number of, uh, a great amount of products, uh, we ended up with a lot of smaller sites doing smaller quantities. Um, and, uh, and once again, counterfeit began to rise as well as illegally imported uh, cigarettes. So this is a picture from my nemesis when I first joined the company in 2004. This was, uh, this was uh, Oda, Oda Media, which operated a website uh, named YesMoke.com. Uh, YesMoke uh, was a site that uh, dealt in plain loads of uh, illegally imported and in some cases counterfeit cigarettes. Coming to the United States, and the uh, and the fellow that uh, that operated.
narrated this with a couple of brothers, but in particular Carlo Messina, uh, uh, actually had the uh, audacity to come here and uh, when we sued them to appear in federal court and to, uh, and to actually defend the lawsuit. And uh, uh, he, uh, he also had the audacity to, uh, to lie under oath and judge uh, during the mission's uh, courtroom. And so I imagine there are probably some warrants outstanding for him right now. Uh, but suffice to say, uh, not only did we target his operation uh, for litigation and then with various law enforcement agencies stepped in after that and shut them down, uh, but, uh, but then the internet changed. So, as I said, we have big players like Go to Media. Now, this is, if you go online, this is what you can see. Uh, there are sites, there are sites like, a bit like this by the dozen. They appeal directly to the consumer, and um, and they and they are operated by a bunch of very mysterious uh, and uh, hard to find characters. So going back to media, what what we did was uh, our, our historical approach was that we would target uh, through civil litigation enforcement uh, the top selling websites because there were so many of them uh, that it was very difficult. Action against all of them out there, so we, uh, so we used uh, some forensic uh, capabilities to determine who was making the most, the most sales to consumers, and we went after them. Uh, and we either sued one website or a number of websites that we could draw connections to them uh, in a single lawsuit. Um, now, as I mentioned, since we have many more players, many more websites in this, uh, doing this. Uh, we have, as the internet has changed, vendors have come out that offer services to us. So we use a, a particular vendor, uh, some of you may know, named Mark Runner, that actually gives us uh, dashboards on uh, who is operating in the space. Uh, we have a continuous monitoring program where we can uh, monitor uh, the internet uh, for, uh, for these kinds of sales, and then actually uh, engage in automated enforcement to knock them down. They may pop back up again, but we, then we can just continue knocking them down, mostly through uh, working uh, with the ISPs, uh, because the sales of tobacco products from most ISPs violate their own terms of service. So if we can establish that the, uh, that the websites are doing that, then they can knock them down in an automated portion of the, uh, format, and we don't have to go after them individually. Uh, then, in addition to that, we have, um, uh, since the courts have become more and more familiar with this kind of uh, cyber piracy. Uh, what they, uh, uh, more courts are now allowing uh, mark holders to join a number of websites in the closet. Uh, so, whereas in the old days, maybe uh, it would be hard to join, uh, to join websites in a single lawsuit, now uh, we can join about hundreds uh, and we will do so and then uh, through the process of getting rolling injunctions uh, against them in seizures, uh, uh, it's, uh, it adds to the efficiency. Then once we get hold of the websites, we redirect them. We used to even make them go uh, down, we used to take them down altogether, make them go dark. Uh, sometimes we would post a copy of the, ju of the judgment when we got to the site. Uh, now, uh, we, uh, I'll show you a copy of, uh, I'll show you a picture of website that we've created uh, as a consumer So anyway, I, I, I put this slide in here just to uh, just to appease my paralegal who works with me folks in on this. This is his favorite analogy of, uh, of the historical versus modern approach. We used to go after sites one by one, uh, like, like uh, the nasty little weeds that they are, and now we go after them. This is a scene from our dashboard that we use. As you can see, we uh, we examine uh, the internet and the printed domains. We deal with both cyber squatters that use our trademarks or our company names in, the, uh, in their domain names to, uh, to appeal to consumers with a pop up on the search engine results page, Google, and other search engines. Uh, and uh, we also uh, examine uh, what they're up to as far as uh, whether they're processing payments, taking orders, and things of that nature. You can see. Uh, from the enforcement activity slide in the bottom uh, right hand corner that, uh, uh, that, that, is a, that is an indication of, uh, of the automated enforcement. So uh, much more of the 
these sites are taken down now uh, automatically then require civil litigation. As you can see, we have about a 98% uh, compliance rate uh, for sites that, uh, that our vendors may be taken down uh, for us without us having to uh, bring a case. And we are also in the social media space. Um, we are, uh, again, working with the those uh, companies uh, through our vendor, uh, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, uh, the purveyors of counterfeit and uh, legally imported uh, cigarettes uh, have also taken to social media to try to uh, the consumers and by using the, the terms of use of those, uh, of those services, um, posting, posting uh, selling product like that over their services as a violation. Connection chart. This is uh, just one of the ways in which, when we're investigating sites, that we draw connections between. Uh, we try to connect as many sites as possible. Oftentimes, you know, you find one website, but there are a bunch of other little you know, a hub site, and then there are other sites that are connected to it that may be further down in the search engine results. Uh, before we bring litigation, we try to join as many as possible, um, and we do that uh, also through uh, use of our vendor as well as our outside counsel. They have certain Those mark holders in the room that uh, that, that, that sue uh, uh, counterfeiters and uh, infringers, these are these are claims. They should be familiar. They should be fairly familiar to you. Uh, mostly, these are Lanham Act based claims. So we'll give us counterfeiting, and we also use trade on counterfeiting. As I said before, uh, the relief that we see when we go into court. Don't show up for the litigation. Uh, we serve them by uh, by Rio service, which allows us to serve them electronically uh, by email. Um, they never show. Occasionally, one of them will, will write back to us a, a snotty email and go away. Uh, but uh, for the most part, uh, these are the default judgments uh, that we obtain by the, uh, by now hundreds of sites, and uh, and we then obtain possession of the domain. This is our new consumer uh, and retailer-based uh, uh, educational website that we launched. Yes, that's a that's a rat on the bottom, and he moves if, they, if you go to this site live. It's called BeCarefulWhereYouBuy.com. This is where now, once we obtain judgments, we obtain uh, uh, control of the websites, uh, report action, and working with the ISPs. We direct those, we redirect those sites. Uh, it's an educational site only. Uh, Not only are you going to, uh, to get fakes that are going to be not what you expect, but uh, also you are uh, supporting the criminal element. That's my information. If, uh, if you want to, if you'd like to know more about our program, uh, please come see me. I'd be happy to talk to you. And, uh, thank you again for having me. Excellent presentation. Our last panelist uh, works at Rosetta Stone and is going to address some of the challenges that he sees internationally in protecting the software that uh, is so important to his business and so important in terms of the industry. Without further ado, Michael Holt. Enforcement team. Our primary goal is to develop innovative programs to enable the Zetastone 
to continually monitor search engines, online marketplaces, B2B sites, uh, social media sites. Um, and we actively partner with other companies, uh, which are software companies. Um, and our resistance brand protection programs have contributed over 500 civil, uh, civil settlements and arrests in the past three years. So what I'm going to talk today about is the and damages. Uh, company brand customers' experiences. Um, what happens when a consumer gets a hold of a counterfeit product? Uh, there's confusion, there's potential, potential threats to the consumers, and the impact on the corporate resources and revenues that companies have to go to spend to eliminate this type of activity. So consumer confusion, one of the main things is the significant discount. So potential customers are asked are misled consistently by rogue websites. And here's a couple little screenshots of how where the resident are in our products that is significantly discounted price. Uh, sometimes 60 to 70 percent off. It confuses consumers into thinking that they can get a unit for uh, products at that price. And it's just not so. Consumers have to deal with online spam campaigns. I'm um, sure that everybody's heard about our little indiscretion in Rosetta Stone and Google had a few years back um, with the pay ad campaigns. Um, we're doing better with that now. But this was taken from 2009. You can see on the paid ads where these are all the red boxes for counterfeiters that own rogue websites. And these rogue websites look exactly like Rosetta Stone's websites. They're actual clones. Um, they advertise on paid ads. You can see they're even using other companies' brand names like LeemanMarcus.com. Even Marcus didn't approve that ad. They only got selling our products, and they probably had no idea that our bad guys were using their brand name <coughs> to drive traffic to the counterfeit website. As you can see right here, here's four examples of these rogue websites, and at some point in time, our Company's website exactly like these websites. They basically went in and just copied every file, reposted it, changed the back end so they're getting the monthly purchases and then shipping the counterfeit items to um, the victims. And since 2009, uh, we've come across 1,800 of these rogue websites, many of which are using squad domain names. So when you go to them, it might be RosettaStoneDiscounts.com or Rosetta Stones with two S's. Um, anything that can make consumers believe that they're actually at the Rosetta Stone website. And that's what they think. They go on to a search engine, they search for Rosetta Stone, they see these paid ads on the right hand side, they see the domain name, it says Rosetta Stone wholesale discount, they click on it, the website looks exactly like it. Consumers get the software back to their house and they install it on their PCs, um, they find out that it doesn't work. And then they call for a type of support team, they're told that it's counterfeit, they have they put a bad argument like, no, I bought from your website, which is exactly the same. Um, and it's, it's just not our stuff. And then once we the, con the consumers get put up to the legal team, we try to help those victims get their money back to the financial institution by writing them letters, um, analyzing the accounts they receive um, so they can send those to their um, financial institution. And as you can see here, this 2009 evolution of the product has, has uh, gotten so much better. The very first one, which is uh, this one right here, uh, had misspellings in the product, didn't look hardly anything like our product. Um, it's spelled State Department, Statute Department, um, piece, and then a piece of pie instead of the U.S. Peace Corps. We use stickers to denote the languages. So after analyzing some of these counterfeit products, what we found was that the exact binary files that they used, the counterfeit used to make these high counterfeits, actually came from online pirate organizations such as the Pirates Bay. So you have one organized crime group that crashed and got around our DRM, our digital rights management tool for the activation codes on our software. Um, then you have another organized crime group that's mass producing and manufacturing these high counterfeits has no idea what might actually be on that software. So when a consumer goes and installs the software, they might have key loggers on it. Or um, in one particular instance, I had a grandfather calling up. He was very upset. He bought his granddaughter a Zestone product uh, for 
Christmas. She went to install it, and illicit content started playing on the media player. Um, so you just never know what you're going to get. And he, he honestly thought he bought from her to the website. Uh, website. <coughs> yeah, I just kind of got ahead of myself in the last slide there. So when one company gets, you know, when one company's product gets counterfeited, unfortunately online, many different other companies are affected by that. The search engines, they, a lot of times the, the black hat SEO specialists, the search engine optim optimization specialists will use stolen credit card frauds to fund their spam ad campaigns that we told, talked about earlier. They'll create false accounts on eBay using the victims' names that they sold to on those websites. Um, you, have com or you have the internet service providers uh, that have to deal with the bandwidth from the pirate material constantly going across the networks. The ISPs who face potential legal threats from various companies, rights holders. And of course, the, the consumer. So, Rosetta Stone has several different ways to protect its digital rights management. Uh, product markings, they also made a, a enforcement manual for the ISP uh, in 2009. We kind of kept it updated. Uh, we haven't brought it to the ICC this year, um, we'll be about to go. Uh, press releases, we like to let everybody know that we are protecting our property online. And we also like to thank the law enforcement and the communities that actually go out there and, and, and do the hard work of stopping um, this activity. Uh, we develop monitoring and uh, monitoring and systems tools. I'll show you kind of what that's about in, in a moment here. And then I'm going to finish up with talking about some of the, the tools that we use to finish out cases, DMCA notices, and cease and desist notices. So Rosetta Stone uses activation codes. Um, our algorithm has not been cracked. What the, the when the people, the, the Russian cracker groups made the crack files, they actually circumvent how the system, the program runs with the computer. The actual activation code which binds it to the computer is not the growth terminology. Codes are active, activated point of sale, so if you go into Best Buy and you buy a Rosetta Stone product, when you buy it there, that activation code is turned on. If you go into Best Buy and you steal our product, or Best Buy's product at that point, and you get it home and try to do a pocket on eBay, it's not going to work for that consumer when they get it. Uh, they're going to end up calling us, we're going to say it's stolen, we're going to work with Best Buy and local law enforcement to um, find out who, who took that product. Another thing we use on authentic Rosetta Stone products is SIDs, the source identification, source identification numbers. Um, they're actually on the actual CDs. When you see stamp CDs, we see some many different attempts at these numbers that are the left. Um, but most of them look like this. They uh, look like your typical burned disc, your CDR, where it's just loop on there. Part of our Enforcement manual we, can, we hand out to every law enforcement agency that we can. Uh, we use the detailed descriptions on how to identify counterfeit Rosetta Stone products so that you can see these on the images of the people that are selling them on online venues like Craigslist and Backpage, GG, Google, all those different places. Uh, for example, Rosetta Stone has never made any of its products on DVD before. So anything that says DVD, you know right away that it's, it's counterfeit. So we'd like to publicize that we go after anybody, everybody that we can. Here's some of our uh, recent publication, publications on, on the different arrests that we've had. <coughs> we like to commit to law enforcement. Uh, we provide thorough, precise investigative reports. When the resistance enforcement team is created, we knew that the general counsel knew that our main protection was going to be on through online enforcement. So we hired individuals with IT backgrounds, computer science. Um, and then from there, we kind of try to get the case ready to give it to the law enforcement professionals who know what they're doing in that aspect more. And we just try to get it to that point for them. We serve as, we serve as extra witnesses and trials. We've gone on raids before. Um, 
nothing thrilling when you walk into a house where guys have threatened you two weeks ago on, on the phone and he's in handcuffs and he's kind of like, and you go up into his house and you're like, that's mine, that's mine. You have all the different UPS shipping labels and you say, you know, every one of those was really set some products and you, know, you should look at those here. We connected law enforcement with uh, other merchant companies. So if law enforcement calls us and they say, hey, I don't have a case for you as a stone, but I have somebody, I have a case going on for Microsoft. Do you know somebody at Microsoft? You say, yes, we do. Or PayPal, yes, we can, we can help you out. Because um, the members of the DSA, the kind of the business software lines, always try to help each other out. For any um, IP holders who can help out law enforcement get in touch with. Because a lot of times, our bad guys are the same bad guys that are affecting other rights holders. Um, for example, the individuals that are selling the P90X counterfeit items, oftentimes you'll see those hand in hand with the Rosetta Stone products. So we can't be everywhere at once. The internet is extremely huge. So how do we go about doing it? Well, we decided that we're going to make the internet report to us. It's the only tool of the center of our group currently. Um, we started developing systems that go out and monitor every single location on Craigslist, every single place on um, eBay, the GG, Backpage. They report to us 24-7, um, 365. And how we do that is with a holder of te internet technology called um, RSS keys. Um, essentially, the computer is out there and pings them whenever there's a new ad posted. Uh, it gets put into this big mesh and it gets filtered out so we filter out the junk and then it comes into our, into our system and we can quickly look at them, uh, identify trends that the infringers are using uh, and figure out well, who's the worst contenders who we need to go out to, to optimize our content. For the sites that don't have RSS built into them, uh, we use third-party online tools, many of which are free, um, XML and XDF scraping utilities uh, to, to get all this information. One of our favorite things to do is the CC to CS tools. The online enforcement is so important. If I find somebody selling counterfeit Rosetta Stone, if I don't have enough information to identify them, we send them a CC to CIS anyway. So later on, chances are, down the line, that individual is going to get caught either selling my product or they're going to get caught selling uh, someone else's product. When law enforcement gets a subpoena for their email records, they're going to see my cease and assist, and they're going to say, you were notified back in 2010 that you were selling counterfeit items, and you continue to do it for three additional years. DNC notices for going after websites. Um, we send the ISPs, a lot of times the, the local ISPs in the United States will take action against websites. Unfortunately, a lot of foreign ISPs, they tend to laugh at you when you send them the DMCA notices, sometimes they respond. Um, so we do a different technique as well as we borrow the term for mark monitor. It's called graveyarding. And we'll go through every different as aspect of point of access for that website. So we'll go, we'll go to Google and we'll find every single link that that website's been at, uh, indexed for. We'll ask Google to remove all those links. And we'll do the same thing with Bing. We'll contact the ISP, we'll go after the payment provider. So basically, at the end of the day, the website is just sitting there. And nobody can find it unless they have direct, direct email. There's so many. And that's... so much for that terrific presentation. And at this point, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to open the floor to you. If anybody has a question, uh, please, you can just uh, raise your hands for any of the four panelists across. Sir, right in the middle, we'll bring a microphone up to you so everyone can hear the question. Oh, um, I see that everything is directed in the, into the retail um, industry. Just curious, uh, regarding financial in industries, uh, why aren't like uh, gift cards and stuff like that from financial in industries considered intellectual property? That's a great question. Actually, I can say this. Uh, part of our conversation this afternoon in the afternoon panel 
is going to address some of the challenges that we see to the financial field as well. So while I don't know exactly why, I think it's probably a learning curve um, in terms of where legislators are over time in learning from handbags as we move from the street level to the online side, it's just a progression of time. The people in this room are the most knowledgeable ones about what's happening, uh, and then that takes time for it to translate to legislators. I don't know if any of our speakers here might be able to add to that. Uh, any other questions that, uh, I, for any of the four panelists at this point? And actually, I do have one. Uh, anyone can speak to this. In terms of cooperation within your industries, could you speak to a little bit about how in a normal competitive situation while you're trying to compete outside, what does this field look like on the issue of protecting intellectual property with your competitors? And Ruby, please. I think it might be, yes. Um, well, um, because it, it is, you know, well beyond competition is a safety issue. We find that uh, very often there will be joint investigations uh, between different pharma companies. You'll frequently even make a joint referral to uh, law enforcement. Um, it also is fairly standard if you have made a referral, or you do a rate, and we, we find a Lily product, we find a Sanofi product, uh, we will notify the people in the region so that they can obtain samples, they can do the testing uh, to see if it's counterfeit, and uh, they can also then be privy to the information law enforcement is willing to share to identify both the upstream and the, down, the suppliers and, and the customers. Brian, are you seeing the same thing when you're looking both domestically and internationally? Because I know so much of your product is coming from China and overseas. That's right. And we have worked with um, Bill Marsh International, even though they're no longer part of our our, our especially in China, uh, leveraging some of their relationships they have with the Chinese government because uh, what we found in, in China in particular is that the, the government and industry have the same enemies uh, when it comes to counterfeiting because the domestic brands get counterfeited there as much as uh, the U.S. brands do. So we've been able to form some partnerships with the with various Chinese law enforcement agencies um, you know, through uh, working with, uh, with, with TMI uh, where even though we do not sell product in China, so. Yeah, it's uh, it's quite common. Uh, you know, we represent a lot of uh, people in the toy industry, and it's very common that all our goods are located in the same places. So, start the investigations, see who's interested, and uh, pursue the same thing in the industry. Thank you. Anything you'd like to add? Um, just as far as we're understanding this, uh, we actively look for the infringers that are selling our competitors' products as well as our, our friends' products as well. Um, law enforcement typically wants to have around $150,000 uh, before they really get interested in the case. So uh, my enemy's enemy is my friend. And we definitely try to find any way that we can rack up that money amount to make, uh, to make it more interesting for law enforcement. And I can say in terms of uh, our office, we often hear about the challenges that brand holders face in bringing their cases to uh, other partners in the law enforcement community because of the, the value level. Uh, and I can say that, you know, that with the district attorney's office, if you see that uh, and you'd like to communicate about building up a case, that's something we would be wanting to talk to you about. I want to thank all four of the panelists that are fantastic presenters and fascinating comments about what the digital landscape and the threats are there, but also the promising technologies that exist right now to counter that. So with a round of applause for all four of us.